All right, everybody, welcome to the Creating Great Culture and Hiring for the Best Fit panel. We're super excited to have everybody here and to be really driving such an important conversation right now in all of our organizations. So um, I'm Jamie Tate. I'm the Chief Vision Officer of Keystone Group International. I will be moderating this panel with Alec and Chelsea. Um, and so we want you, we're going to talk about quite a few concepts and talk through some information. We want you taking notes, writing down your ahas as we go, because we are going to do a great breakout um, about in about 25 minutes where we can have the discussions kind of more about our organizations and really get deeper in the conversation and topics. Um, so again, I'm the Chief Visionary, Visionary Officer of Keystone Group International. Keystone is a group, is an organization that's really focused on bridging the gap between business needs and human needs and helping organizations think, act, and interact in a new way so they can scale in a stronger way. Um, and Chelsea is the Chief Strategy Officer for Keystone um, and works with a lot of our clients on the culture and strategy side. And then Alec is the CEO of Vision Spark, where they help owners hire great leaders for their organizations. So our panel is very well qualified to be having this conversation today because they've seen a lot. And that's the wisdom that they're going to share with us as we get started today. But before we get started with the panel, I want to turn it over to Alex, because for most of you, this platform is probably new. This is amazing. Keystone is using it for all of their webinars because it's really just engaging the audience in a different way. So I wanted Alex to just quickly tell you about Lexco in case after this, you wanna know more information. Thanks, Jamie. Um, so the, the quick run through is the focus of Lexco is really about, as you've probably already seen, interactions between folks in the platform. It's about building community. So connecting with each other, connecting, you're going to have a great opportunities today to interact with these amazing experts with each other. Um, so again, as Jamie said, uh, capture those questions and we're actually going to talk them through later on. The presentation itself is being recorded. Nothing at your tables is being recorded. So feel free to have those deep, rich conversations. That's what this is about. And then you'll have that content available afterward for uh, being able to digest. And again, we'll talk a little bit more later about how to move around. But for right now, enjoy. Great. Thanks, Alex. I wanted to just take a minute or so to talk about the model that is really driving all of the webinars that we're going to be doing. So the Keystone Impact Model is something, if Alex, you want to pull that up. Perfect. Um, this is what we're going to be driving the conversation around. And what this really is, is helping organizations understand the factors that really balance the business needs and the human needs. And so today we're going to be starting at the base because we believe the foundation is the most important piece. We're going to be talking about conscious leadership and trust. And then as these webinars move forward and we'll share information at the end about what the next topics will be, but we'll be constantly talking about how do you build this, this strength, this muscle in your organization and how do you hire for it? So we're trying to take those two angles at this model to really help create strength in your organizations because it's not just a one size fits all approach that's going to solve and that really is going to help us scale in a healthy way. So that's the background of kind of what we're doing. So I want to dive into the two aspects, the conscious leadership and the trust, where we're going to spend the bulk of our time today. And as we break out into tables, if there's other areas you want to dive into or you can even stay at the end and have more conversations, we're happy to have those conversations. But I want to start with this. And Chelsea, I want to start with you because conscious leadership is something that you you we work a lot on. We're working with a lot of clients on. I want you to start by talking about what is conscious leadership? Because to a lot of people, this is something new. How, how do you define it? Yeah, well, and as you see, you know, conscious leadership goes across a whole bottom of this model that we created around culture and how you create an impact on your business, because leaders impact every single element of our culture and of our business. And so this is a really, really big deal, which is why we're starting with this. And so our definition of conscious leadership is the way that we as leaders, as we think, act and interact, and then how those actions impact everyone around us. So it's having that consciousness, that awareness of how all of our actions and all of our behaviors are really impacting every single person that is around us. And so there's different ways that we can look at this and kind of assess where we're at and where we need to go. Um, a lot of this is initially about self-reflection. And so we have an overview here of, of some of the different elements that equal um, 
conscious leadership. And the first one is self-awareness. And that is where we all need to start. We all need to understand where am I as a leader? What are my superpowers? What's my personal why? What are my personal values? Um, and everyone really needs um, some outside input on this and a coach to help kind of push us and dig into, you know, why are we feeling the way we're feeling? Why are we acting the way that we're acting? So that self-awareness piece is, is a really big aspect of conscious leadership. And that's where it has to begin. Um, and then coaching is a skill that each of us as leaders really needs to develop. And the first skill within coaching that I recommend leaders learning is just how to be um, curious, ask questions, dig deeper. Um, that's going to really help you to um, help your people grow and develop, to be able to pull their potential and their superpowers out of them um, and really allow you to understand who you're able to delegate to and how you can grow these people. So coaching your people is a big aspect. Intelligence, and with this, I don't mean just intellectual intelligence, but I mean emotional intelligence, um, positive intelligence, relational intelligence, um, conscious communication. Um, and just intelligence around that. So it's having a broader understanding, again, of how you think, act, and interact. Um, growth mindset's a huge one, too, is what equals conscious leadership. And just the belief that the, the skills that we have, the intellect, the talents, can all be developed. And it's not things that we're necessarily born with. We can grow and develop these skills over time. Um, and we, it's looking at our failures as an opportunity to grow, an opportunity to, to develop. And so really having that growth mindset for ourselves as individuals, but then also for our people as well. Um, that it's our job as leaders to help them grow and develop um, continuously. And the last is well-being. And this is just really caring about our people as a whole person um, and really seeing them as human beings and understanding what are their needs as humans um, from a health perspective, from a social perspective, financial perspective, of course, and then along with all of the other what do they need in their job? How are we going to help them grow and develop? Do they feel safe and trusted? That psychological safety um, comes into well-being. And so these are all part of the, the components that equal a conscious leader. And that if we are aware of where we're at with each of these, we can start to grow and develop them as, as we grow in our leadership journey. And Chelsea, this is such an important aspect right now in organizations. I just read a stat um, that they did a study and that 58% of people um, claimed to, to trust a stranger more than their direct boss, supervisor, leader. Yes. So we're at a trust deficit in most organizations. And, and it's appalling when I tell leaders that, but yet it's, are we doing the things that we need to do to shift that, right? How are we creating? And that's really what conscious leadership is. It's, it's a simple concept, complicated, you know, to actually do, and it, it takes time. Um, how do you, when people are looking at this and saying, am I a conscious leader? And I'll, I'm going to get to you as well, because I know you guys do a ton on the hiring side, but how do you assess yourself on, on whether I'm good at these things or not? Yeah. So I think there's, it's all becomes around self-awareness. And so I'm a, I'm a, a assessment junkie. I love taking assessments, any assessment out there free or, you know, hundreds of dollars worth of assessments, because the more that you can understand about yourself and kind of where your baseline is, the more you'll be able to know where do I need to grow and where do I need to develop? Um, we have on the on the resources and tools table that you can go to after we're done here. We have a very quick conscious leader assessment that you can take, a self-assessment. Alec is going to talk about a much deeper, um, broader a conscious leader assessment that, that they have. Um, so it's really just digging in and understanding where you're at. As I said, getting that feedback from an outside resource or doing like a 360 review on your for yourself and you know partnering with your HR team or an outside resource to do 360 reviews to get feedback on how do your people see you how do they think you're thinking acting and interacting with them and and that'll help you to gain that kind of whole perspective not just from where you think you're at but from where your peers your direct reports um, think that you're at as well I love that. We were having a conversation at our table at the beginning about some of these great programs and leadership development, emerging leaders. Mm -hmm. And the message here is, is you want to get this and start teaching this before you actually need them to be leaders. Yes. And that, that's an important thing. And then the other complicating factor, and Alec, I want to turn to you because we have so many clients that struggle with people can interview really well. How do you get underneath the surface, right? And really understand that they're not just feeding you something that you think you want to hear. How do you get to this when you guys are going through the interview process? Because I know you guys are awesome at this. Yeah, so there are really 
two tools that you can use to interview to evaluate conscious leaders. So um, you mentioned that 58% of, uh, of employees are more likely to to trust a stranger than their own than their own boss. And uh, so I have another stat here that um, 82% of companies, this is from Gallup, 82% of companies fail to choose the right leader. 82%. That is costly. That is very expensive is where my brain goes. <laughs> it's, it's very expensive. And I decided to uh, put this to the test and uh, before the pandemic, I would meet with visionaries one on one and I'd say, you know, I'm just curious out of the last 10 leaders you hired, how many would you rehire knowing what you know now? And the average response was two to three. So it was very much in line with Gallup's study. So how do you evaluate candidates? So one is you want to use really high quality interview questions, behavioral based questions, examples are key. And the second tool is to use an assessment tool that measures not only personality dimensions, but mental aptitudes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, this, this assessment is super powerful. Um, and I'm gonna show you a couple really cool things about it. So here's, here's the assessment. There's lots of information on the page. The brackets that you see in the middle um, are brackets for uh, a COO, an EOS integrator, uh, number two in the company. And we want to see scores in those brackets. So that gives us a really good indicator if someone's going to be successful. So uh, with what we're talking about today, conscious leadership, there's a couple dimensions that I want to highlight. And the first one is emotional development. So this measures someone's um, tolerance for themselves and others. So if someone scores low in this area, they have a high sense of urgency and they're very impatient with themselves and with others. And so for someone to be a stronger conscious leader, we would want to see scores that are on the higher level where they um, have a little bit more maturity. They're more confident in who they are. Um, they're tolerant of others. Um, they have realistic expectations. So that's one dimension. Another dimension that I want to highlight is assertiveness. This is someone's want for control. So someone who is a uh, really high, like they're a nine in assertiveness, they're they're my way or the highway. They have to be in charge. They have to be in control. And um, so they're not really uh, reading the room. They're not oftentimes self-aware. And someone on the complete other side, um, that's where you'd want some team members, support staff. So we're really looking for a, a middle score here. Um, the next one's competitiveness. And this measures someone's orientations towards uh, the team. So someone who scores really high here is very, uh, they're more I driven, right? And so scores one through six are more team oriented. So a score of a six is all about the team winning. And so this is a good score to have for a conscious leader. So those are, uh, well, I got one more here. One is uh, the other, the last one's mental toughness. So this measures someone's uh, thickness of their skin, how sensitive they are. So someone who's really thick skin, they're tough, they not, may not be empathetic or sensitive to uh, the mood in the room. And so that's a, we want to see scores in the middle there for leaders who, uh, conscious leaders. So, um, so I, that, I, yeah, go ahead. I love this because I'm, con I'm thinking of a client where their best salesperson was promoted to being a sales manager. And it, right, I see this all the time. The person who's been there the longest, who has the most seniority or has the most experience Mm -hmm. But when you look at this, the best salesperson and the way we want them to look on this assessment is very different than how we want a leader to look. And I think that's that's an issue that a lot of companies deal with. And Chelsea, I know you see that as well. Mm -hmm. And so an assessment like this helps with those brackets, right, helps us stay true as the owners and the, the people who are hiring to not I like the person and I know they can do awesome things and produce here, but their skill set isn't the right skill set for this seat. It might be for another seat. Yes, and using an assessment will take your instinct and gut out of the equation in terms of making that successful hire. You know, you really want to rely on the data. And um, so, yeah, so there's there's uh, assessments are a great way to really learn of someone's core behavior, not learned behavior, but core behavior. 
So you talked about the interviewing too. How, how, do you, how do you interview for these, right? Like, are there specific questions? Because I also find that a lot of clients, they're using the interview questions that they used 10 years ago. And right, that is not a piece that's really evolved very well. And I think it's a super simple, inexpensive way to really ramp up your, your hiring. Yeah, so I, I have three questions that I'll share with you. And then in the resources page, you guys can you know get these questions to you. But um, when you're interviewing, um, make sure you're listening for specific examples, you know, uh, dates, names, times. So here's, here's uh, an interview question. Tell me the five words you believe would be used by your supervisor and or the people that report to you to describe you. And then a follow-up to that is give me examples as why well you chose those words. Okay, so that's, that's a question. Um, another one is the, the way a leader makes people feel is true measure of their impact. Please tell me how you treat your team members. A follow-up to that, if you could listen to one of your team members talking at the dinner table with family members, what would they say about you? So those, those are really thought provoking, some different questions. Uh, and then the last one, um, it's a feedback question. So how much feedback and in what form do you like to get from people you report to and those that report to you? Now tell me about some feedback and the source you've received recently. So those are different interview questions. Um, they're unique. Um, it's really gives you a sense of the uh, person, uh, their learned behavior, and you can evaluate that with with the assessment tool. Cool. Those are some serious questions. Like I'm like sweating. Like how would I answer that? <laughs> this is good because back to Chelsea's point, this is driving the self awareness. Mm -hmm. I, and even how I answer it, like that's a really great question. Like let me think about that. It's right that true person is going to come out. So I think these are fantastic. So by doing these things we've talked about, by that self-awareness, right, we're going to move to that idea of trust. So we talked about conscious leadership. Conscious leadership actually creates trust. So yeah. Chelsea, this one is a super nebulous thing, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of companies think they have it, but they don't actually know what it means. So talk to us about how you define this. Yeah. So the reality is that trust is the cornerstone of our culture, of our leaders, of really any relationship that you have, whether it's it's professional or personal. I think we all know this and that that's not a like, oh, shocker, Chelsea, <laughs> trust is important, but it truly is the cornerstone of it. And that's what we have in our model it, in the corner of, of the whole thing, because it connects all the different pieces. And it's really hard to start talking about performance development or how to have more intentional communication or how to hold someone accountable if you don't have this foundation of trust. Um, and so when we talk about trust, what we mean by that is that there is strong psychological safety, which is a basic human need, um, which is understanding or, or believing that you're not going to be punished or humiliated for speaking up with your ideas, speaking your mind, sharing your concerns, admitting your mistakes. Um, that's psychological safety, um, mutual respect. And so just true belief that everyone has valuable contributions that they can add to, to the group. And as leaders, we're seeing that in our people and then seeing the different attributes as unique contributions that they have. And then honesty, which is just, you know, being truthful, being sincere, being candid. Um, that honesty is, is a really important part to, to building trust. So if we want to be honest with ourselves, what are, there are clearly symptoms that we think it's high trust, right? We can go have a beer after work, right? Or we, we get along fine. How do we know below the surface the trust is not where we need it to be? Yeah, so there's quite a few things, quite a few symptoms that you can find with low trust. And the first one is if you see unhealthy competition and clicks starting to form, you kind of see the sub team bonding, kind of like Mean Girls, <laughs> the movie Mean Girls, but you get that kind of a feel in the environment. Um, and if you see a lot of high turnover in teams, that's often because there's this high level of competition or high level of clicks that are, that are happening within and around the, the organization. Um, the second one is guarded communication. So people aren't being forthright. They're not being open and honest. Uh, people are kind of hoarding that information that they have and not wanting to share their knowledge with other people um, because there's low trust. And so people, it seems, are being very careful, calculated with what they say, who they say it to, when they say it. That's certainly a sign of low trust. Um, mediocre work and not achieving our goals. 
Um, people are just playing it safe. They're doing, you know, they're achieving the lowest output possible, not going above and beyond, not going that extra mile. Welcome back, everybody. We're going to do a quick debrief. It sounds like there was some awesome conversations at the table. So we want you guys to be able to share that with each other and those learnings. So Chelsea, I'm going to kick it off with you with some of the discussion in your room. Yeah, um, so Pat, uh, we're gonna invite you up to stage here. If you just wanna click the, the hop onto stage there, when you see that, that would be great. Um, and Pat had a really great, just mixture of aha and just a good story, I think, to share. I think we all learn from each other's stories. And so if you just wanna um, touch on Pat, your, the, the trust and leadership and adding that layer of, of management and how that process went for you. Yes, uh, thank you, Chelsea. Um, I, my big aha moment was the 58% trust more of a stranger than they do their own supervisor. Um, our company has gone through some growth and, you know, we added a management layer a couple of years ago, eh, maybe more like 18 months ago. It wasn't always well received because there wasn't a management layer. There were some people which, who left, I believe, which partly because of who the leaders chosen were and part of the great resignation. So I think there was dual factors there. But we implemented um, EOS at the beginning of the year. We've just, you know, we're rounding at quarter two and we've been, um, you know, trying to get the right people in the right seat. And it, and it seems like we are. And it's, we're hitting our rocks. We're making it. I told Chelsea, we just updated our handbook. Um, so that was a big step. Um, but I think, you know, people are feeling good. And there is definitely a momentum going on here and a positivity that you can feel. Awesome. Thanks, Pat. And I think, you know, the biggest thing there was just that right person, right seat. And if you truly have conscious leaders and leaders who are going to grow and develop and build trust, they have to be the right person for your organization and then the right person to be in that seat. And so that's a continuous evolution and, and analysis of that. But it sounds like you guys are working through that. So uh, and a lot of lessons learned in there. We don't have it all figured out, right, Pat? We're, we talked about that. Not, we're not even close, but they, we're trying. We're trying. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks for hopping up. You can head back to your table. And Chelsea, actually, so I can give some instructions there so that um, uh, folks know how to jump off of the stage once you're up here. Again, that magic arrow on the middle left side opens and closes the map, uh, the map itself. Um, so Pat, if you want to open up your map and then you can click back over to table two, click the join button and that'll take you over there. All right. Thank you. The magic of technology. I love it. So Alec, it sounds like in your group, there was some great conversation too, and there's some maybe great stories or ahas to share. Yeah, so um, uh, Steph, uh, we, we had a uh, two or three. Uh, so Steph Altum had a, a nice aha that she'd like to share. Um, yes, I liked the symptoms of low trust because I've been working with a group that they're really focused on building uh, an environment of trust within the company. And we're, we're doing meetings, we're doing all kinds of stuff, but it's really helpful to have the symptoms of what does low trust look like so you can see when you start to backslide into the low trust, whether it's someone you hire and there's clicks that start to form, it may seem harmless. Oh, they're just getting along, they're just friends, but it's really nice to be able to identify that before it becomes a problem rather than after. Yeah, that's great stuff. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and then Jenny in our group uh, had uh, one or two great ahas. Okay, now, I'm sorry, I have to ask again, how do I get off the stage? <laughs> get off the stage. <laughs> so if you open the map on the left side, um, halfway down, there's an arrow there that will open the map. Oh, yeah. Join button. Okay. Mm hmm. And then I can go. You can join any on. of the tables. Yep. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. So I had one. Um, so we're working with um, a, a, an outsource group as we're growing our company to help us with the hiring. And for me, it is to making sure that we're communicating with that um, company as we're doing that early stage evaluation before we're getting the candidates, we're working with the EOS process. So we've already are on the same page about culture and fit and our core values, um, but making sure that we're communicating down that the evaluation questions that they're using to um, screen the, the candidates that are coming in and push up to us are just as intentional um, and are including this piece as we're looking for those leaders. Um, because we definitely want to use that on our 
and that, and that mid-level tier to move people forward, but we want to make sure that those right people are even getting through the door. Yeah, it, it, Jenny, that's that's great. Um, Harvard Business Review, they did a, a long study and they, they looked at super successful candidates and what made them really successful. They looked at their education, their experience, industry knowledge, and the number one ingredient for someone's success was fit in the organization. That's what it came down to. So and, cool, and great. How, and how they're onboarded, right? The, the, the intentionality of once we have them in the door, mm -hmm. how do we onboard them, right? I've seen statistics on if someone has a three to six month onboarding plan that's really structured, they're 75% mm -hmm. more likely to be with you right? Three years yeah. off the road. So it, it's setting them up for success once we get them in the door so that they're not coming in the front door and leaving out the back and, and yeah. you know, we're able to retain them. And we say at Vision Spark, the hiring process doesn't stop once the person right. walks through the door. You know, that onboarding process is so important and so many organizations don't want to spend any time with the people they just hired. And, you know, you just spent thousands of dollars in the process and and you're going to just let them work on the Penske file. That's a Seinfeld reference there. But <laughs> yeah. well, um, the, the best analogy I've heard for this is you wouldn't just get married and then never focus on each other ever again. Right. You wouldn't just get married and then stop your conversation, stop your date night, stop hanging out. Right. So it's the same thing with doing someone on board, like treat it like a marriage that you need to build this relationship, build this trust, connect with one another consistently. You don't just do it for the first three weeks, four weeks. This is an ongoing thing that we need to keep going on to build and keep that relationship strong. It's not a checkbox, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it's a process that we need to go through. I mean, you'd be shocked at the, you probably wouldn't be Alec, but um, the number of companies where we're like, well, did we just throw them in the deep end of the pool with no swimmies, like no little floaty <laughs> things, or did we actually help them ease their way into it? And it's shocking the number of people that just bring somebody on a couple of days, and then they're off doing the job, right? We yeah. haven't even we haven't even created the sense of belonging with the organization, which is a huge cultural element, mm -hmm. right? They're just a person doing a job, very transactional versus a, a part of the culture. Yeah, I think it's really important. Um, and I don't know if we have time for one more aha, um, but um, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, who did I say? Haley um, in my group. Haley Eckert had. A great aha. Hello. <laughs> um, yes. So we can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so one thing that I just thought was um, mind boggling was the um, statistic around 58 percent of uh, employees would trust a stranger over trusting their um, boss manager. And this whole trust deficit uh, is really quite concerning. And so I think we've excelled at the cultural fit and hiring for um, and hiring in that regard. But then it's the constant conversation and ensuring that you're in alignment with employees. And so uh, even beyond the onboarding, but just that those check ins and making sure that um, you're meeting their needs, uh, both personally, professionally, um, so they stay satisfied is is incredibly important and helps helps build that that trust. Yeah, I love that 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 stat is is shocking to everybody. Maybe we should have just called the whole thing that, and that would have been like. I mean, it's appalling, and it right, but it, it's so true in so many organizations. Hopefully, mm -hmm. not a lot of the organizations on here. Um, but I want to I want to start to kind of wrap us a little bit here and we're going to stick around if you want to go we'll tell you how to get to like to talk about this further. And if there's more support that we can provide you. Um, but really quick, um, we're going to our next episode of this webinar is going to focus on yet another of the two building blocks we're going to talk about strategic vision and purpose. But really, how do you tie the two together? Because we can have a really great strategy that does not bring people into the purpose of our organization. And how do you drive that vision and that purpose all the way through the organization? So that will be our next um, webinar that we do on that. Um, Alex, do you want to kind of tell everybody what they're going to do and how they're going to get to the post discussion if they want to be at the table of experts? Absolutely. Um, so we have some amazing experts here with us today who are uh, just dying to talk more about any questions, whether they're the material from today or otherwise. 
Um, so you'll see if you again open the map, that's that magic arrow that t on the tab that opens and closes. Uh, there's three tables at the top where you'll see the uh, the folks from Keystone and Vision Spark hanging out. Where hit them with the questions, hit them with the hard questions, the interesting questions. Um, if you met some folks today that you want to continue your conversation with, space doesn't go anywhere. Hang out. Feel free to invite somebody over to another table. Uh, if you'd like to know a little bit more about this platform, uh, Jay and I'd be happy to share that. Before you go, make sure that you do. Don't click yet. Make sure you click the join button over in the resources and tools table. That's where you'll find a number of takeaway assessments and tools that the, these folks have put together for you. So please make sure you do that as well. And we're all looking forward to talking with you. So come join us at those tables at the top of the map or again, meet some great new best friends. Thanks, everybody.